Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. It is a joy and pleasure to gather with you here for this time of worship and celebration and praise. It is especially a joy to gather in an air-conditioned room. It got a little bit warm at 9 o'clock today, but that's okay. Whether you are joining us here on the campus of the church or online, it's a pleasure to welcome all that are members, all who are visiting, all who are here simply because of your love for Christ and his love for you. I want to extend a word of appreciation uh, this morning to Elder Jenna Wilson, who is assisting in our worship leadership this morning as Jan Farley, I think, is in Hawaii, but don't hold that against her. She gets some time off. That's a good thing. We are here. God's people are everywhere. God is everywhere, worshiping today. So let us be called together to worship as we read responsively the call to worship taken from the 15th chapter of the book of Revelation. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God, the Almighty. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. Friends, let us worship God. in your worship bulletin. Awesome and amazing God, you call us to follow you, and each day you fill us with the power of your spirit. We are given your courage and yet act with caution and timidity. We know your intentions for justice, yet too often keep silent or yield to the complexity of issues and do nothing. We are overwhelmed with your love, yet are hesitant to mention your name to another. We have been forgiven much, yet we harbor old resentments, hold on to vast hurts, and turn away from reconciliation. Forgive us, Lord, for we have sinned. Set our faces to forgiveness and our hands to your work that we might be your light to the world in assurance of your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness 
and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. May the peace be with you. Now please share signs of peace with each other. I'm so thrilled that we did not forget how to be nice and peaceful with each other, even though we were stuck at home for so long. You're to be congratulated for that. Friends, let me share you a little bit of news about what's going on in the life of the church so that we can continue to uh, enjoy the fellowship of uh, fellow Christians and enjoy the work that God has set before us. First of all, let me ask you to save the date, Sunday, August 14th, five o'clock in the evening. We will have a summer sunset jazz gathering out on the patio. Our own Dante Fire from our worship band is bringing his group and we're going to kick back and relax and enjoy some beautiful music. We'll give you more details about it, but put that on your calendar right now, Sunday, August 14th, five o'clock. Next Sunday is the, or excuse me, two weeks from uh, today is uh, the 24th of July, and we will have our traditional Christmas in July event that day. This is your opportunity to share some of the resources God has given you, especially all those clothes and all those appliances and all that dusty, worn out old money that you have sitting around in your house and bring it here to the church. We'll put it in a huge truck. It will go off to one of our mission partners. They will sell it and use that to support their work and some of the work that we share with them. So that's a couple of weeks from today. Start cleaning out those closets now. Next Sunday, the 17th, after this service here in the sanctuary, we will be doing a report uh, on the recent trip that I took into Eastern Europe uh, to visit with Ukrainian refugees. So if you'd like to see more of the pictures, hear more of the stories about what's going on, plan to hang around after worship for about 45 minutes. We'll also be recording that if you would like to watch it later. And then today, right after the service, uh, we'll take a few minutes to say hi to each other, but we're going to have another chat with Jack. You remember those opportunities to visit about what we are going to hear in the sermon and to think about the implications for your own lives of, of what we're going to be hearing from uh, the book of Ephesians. Uh, so we'll gather out in the patio under the pergola and spend about 45 minutes or so visiting with each other in the chat. If you don't plan to stay, you might want to take one of these little inserts, uh, these little sheets of paper. They're going to be out on the tables as you leave. There are a series of questions here that I've written for for you to ponder and to answer for yourselves uh, about how it is that you're going to do something with what, uh, what, what we encounter here in worship today. We'll be using this as well as the guide for our conversation. So if you can stay, great, take one of those. If you can't, go ahead and take one as well. There are many things that we do in order to place ourselves before God so that God can do something with us. And one of those things that we do is to offer ourselves to God. We symbolize that, we signify that in our worship in the time of our offering. And so now in the next few moments as some beautiful music is being played, I would invite you if you feel so led to bring your financial offering this morning to one of the baskets that's on either side of the chancel here. And in that way we will visibly signify our offering to God.
Let us pray. Awesome Father, you are mighty and full of grace. You are our strength and fortress. We humble ourselves before you for before you for all you are and all you have done for us. We praise you for countless blessings and for loving us beyond measure in a way we cannot comprehend or deserve. The world is broken and so are we. The weight of the burdens in our hearts and on our shoulders can be overwhelming. We bear pain brought on by illnesses we or loved ones endure, conflict within families, wars, injustice, and the list goes on and on. These life challenges and situations cause us to lean into you, to find your strength within us, to remember your promises and continue to move forward. Lord, lighten our shared burdens and motivate, a, motivate us to serve and care for others as your son Jesus taught us to do in word and in action. Have us do your will and not waste our suffering. I lift up my brothers and sisters here at the Village Church, those watching online locally and globally, our brothers and sisters in our communities, state, nation, and the world, praying you'll give us an awareness of you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit within us. I pray we seek your will and see you in all that we do. Thank you, Lord, for listening. Thank you for answering. And thank you for your presence with us in your Son as we pray together in the words that so long ago he taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
stand with me now as you are able. And then turn your heart, mind, soul, and strength to this word from the word of God as recorded in the letter to the Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Picture yourself climbing into the attic of the old homestead back there somewhere. I hope everyone has an old home back there somewhere where you can climb up into the attic and rummage around in the stuff of the family that has accumulated for hopefully decades, maybe even centuries. I've had the opportunity to do that in the old family homestead on a hillside in North Carolina. And I've had the opportunity to open the old trunks that smell like so many mothballs and so much mold that I'm probably dying from it right now. Who knows? Picture yourself finding a packet of old letters. By the way, for our younger audience, a letter is a piece of paper that you have written some words on that somebody carries to another place and they open it up and they read the letter. <laughs> I've had the chance to do that as well. As you read the letters, you begin to learn more about who your family and friends were, what they did, what made them tick. And as you learn about them, you learn about yourself. Maybe you find some old photographs and you are confronted with the faces of people who look just like you. And you realize that from the get-go, you never had a chance. <laughs> You read the letters and you begin to understand what made them tick and you begin to understand what makes you tick. You begin to understand what makes things the way they are. We've been doing just that. As we have read an old letter that's common to all of us in the family, the family of faith. We've been reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, a city in modern-day Western Turkey. And so far, in reading that letter, we have learned some very crucial truths about who we are and why things are the way they are. We've learned that God blesses us with grace and peace. We've learned that in Jesus of Nazareth, God was about the business of restoring his creation, especially that part of creation that is humanity, 
We've learned that in Jesus, we have the ultimate word of God's truth, God's revelation of who we are meant to be and what this life is supposed to be. And all of that ultimately is good news. Sometimes we get letters that have bad news. This letter tells us honestly about the bad news of how humanity goes astray and creation is broken, but how in Jesus God is about the business of putting it all back together. I sort of think that as Paul was writing this letter, probably dictating it, in a sense preaching it to a scribe who then wrote it down, that Paul himself felt overwhelmed by the amazing good news that he had just shared. And so he breaks into sort of a, a hymn of thanksgiving and he proclaims these beautiful, beautiful things about God. And then he says a prayer for all those who believe these things. Paul has just told us what the church has always believed and I pray always will, that the Holy Spirit of God has been at work, that the triune God has been at work creating and then recreating in Jesus. That's what God is actually all about. The business of remaking the world. Now let me remind you of a phrase that became popular in the very early 1900s, before any of us were around, but it became popular again in the 1990s. And all I need to do is quote four letters to you and you will instantly know what the phrase is. WWJD. Remember that? WWJD. Now, at the end of the 1800s, a guy named Charles Sheldon wrote a book called In His Steps. What would Jesus do? It was a consideration of how Jesus might act in the modern world of the early 1900s. And that phrase got to be popular, what would Jesus do? It became popular again in the 1990s when somebody decided to create those little rubber bracelets that everybody wore for a while. How many of you had one of those that said WWJD on it? What would Jesus do? How many of you still have one of those. Yes, those are kind of like plastic bags. They will last for thousands and thousands of millennia, especially in your drawer at home that you never clean out. What would Jesus do? WWJD. Well, not long after that phrase became popular again, a couple of authors, Brian McLaren and Leonard Sweet, had this to say. They said that God is waiting for the church to stop asking WWJD, what would Jesus do? And start asking WIJD, what is Jesus doing? There's the question. I think Paul himself could not have said it any better. Now, Paul, in his moment of, of ecstasy, if you will, just being overwhelmed by the amazing things that God had just done, in a sense, in Paul's time, in Jesus, Paul says something amazing. He said, now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. We often use that as a charge at the end of a worship service saying, wow, God, you've done amazing things and you're going to do amazing things with us. In fact, I halfway expected some of you to get up and walk out after I read that phrase because you would have thought the service was over but you didn't, that's good. Think about that phrase. There is a power at work within us that is able to accomplish more than we can even imagine. 
I know some of you pretty well by now, and I know that you have wild imaginations. <laughs> Paul says that God is so powerful that, that God can do more than you can even think of. So let's think about that. The same power that was in Jesus Christ is power that is in us because it's the power of God. The power that comes through the gift of the Spirit. And the same mission that Jesus had is the mission that we have of doing something with that power like Jesus would have done and like Jesus still is doing. What is the most that you can imagine for God's world? I heard a story one time about a man who was walking on a deserted beach here in San Diego somewhere, and he came upon a small wooden crate. He took the crate home and pried it open, and inside the crate was an old oil lamp. He started to brush away the sand and the seaweed and all the stuff that had gotten into it, and as he was rubbing the lamp and polishing it, a genie popped out. And the guy was shocked, but the genie was happy. The genie said, finally, after all these centuries, I've been released from my imprisonment here in this lamp. Out of my gratitude, I'm going to grant you one wish. Now, I know you think it's supposed to be three wishes. No, this is inflation at work. <laughs> one wish. The genie said to the man, I will grant any wish that you would ask of me. And so the man thought for a minute and he said, you know, I've always been afraid to fly and that's limited very much the places where I can go in the world. And I've always been afraid of the water. I've never set foot in a boat and that's always limited the places where I can go in the world. But, but living here in San Diego, I've all, always stood longingly looking out at the sunset and saying out there somewhere is Hawaii. I've always wanted to go to Hawaii. Jeannie, would you please build me a bridge to Hawaii? And the genie just hung his head and said, do you have any idea how much steel and concrete that would take? Do you have any idea how complicated of an engineering feat it would be to create such a bridge to cross 2,500 miles of open ocean? Do you have any idea how long it would take to accomplish such a task even for a magical genie like me? I'm sorry, no, I cannot build you a bridge to Hawaii. And so the man said, okay, will you still grant me a wish? The genie said, yes, anything else. Anything else you ask for? The man said, great. He said, would you please explain women to me? <laughs> and the genie said, would you like that bridge two lanes or four? <laughs> now, that's an old joke. It comes from a time that preachers would not lose their job if they used such a joke. <laughs> but it gets the point across, doesn't it? What amazing thing would you dream of that God could do in the world if he used you? God created the world. God created you. God called forth a nation to be an example to all the other nations of what he was trying to do with the rest of us, a nation of poor, helpless, argumentative, stubborn, faithless folks that time and time again were wiped out by other nations. But that one is still here with us. God even conquered evil and death and lives among us still. That's the power of God. 
Christians believe that Jesus is still alive and by his power. You and I are called and commanded to know his love and to live his life of loving the world. Let me say that again. Mike, that was really good, by the way. Christians believe that Jesus is still alive and by his power working in the mystery of the Spirit, you and I are called and commanded to know his love and to live his life of loving the world. The key to all of that is Jesus. Never once do the scriptures say that all of our intelligence, all of our military power, all of our economic strength, all of our best intentions can save the world. It is only the power of God working through the power of the Spirit to empower us to live as Jesus still is living that is the hope of the world. There was once an ancient monastery that had been around for hundreds of years. And in its heyday, it had been the home of hundreds of monks who prayed and worshiped and studied, who served the larger community around them. But over time, the monks began to lose their way. They got tired. People became disinterested in what the monastery was all about. And so it turned out that only a few very old monks were living there until one day a messenger came and said, I have a message for you from God. The message is this. Jesus actually is living here among you, one of you, is Jesus, and he's been here all along. Well, the monks, of course, began to wonder who. They knew it wasn't them, but there were all the others, that it had to be one of them. And so they began to look at each other and say, maybe you're Jesus. They began to treat each other with more respect and more love. They began to pay closer attention to each other. They also paid closer attention to God. Their prayers became more fervent. Their worship became more vital. Their study became more focused. Their service among themselves and among the community became more engaged as they tried to find out who was Jesus living among them. After a while, the community around them began to notice that the monks were full of spiritual life and full of acts of service and love in the community. And, and actually, young people began to join the monastery again because it was a place that was full of joy and full of power and full of hope. The whole place was transformed because they knew that Jesus was living there. And of course, Jesus had been there all along in each one of them. What can happen in us? What can happen in our church and in our world if we will allow Christ Jesus to take up residence in our hearts and heads and actions? Let me tell you about a man named William. William was born in England in 1759. He became a philanthropist and a politician. Those two things could coexist equally <laughs> at one time. In 1784, William was elected to Parliament where he served until 1812 the same year that 
another war started between Great Britain and the United States, a war that would end up two years later with Francis Scott Key writing his famous little poem that we talked about last week and the last stanza of which I sang poorly for you last week. William was known for a few things. He became quite famous, actually. He became famous for his efforts to reform society. About a year after he joined Parliament, he had an encounter with Jesus, and he became a fervent Christian. He changed his entire lifestyle. He changed the entire focus of his political efforts. He became involved in something called the Society for the Suppression of Vice. I love that name. The Society for the Suppression of Vice described its work, and I quote here, as being concerned about the profanation of the Lord's Day and profane swearing, concerned about the publication of blasphemous, licentious, and obscene books and prints, concerned about the selling by false weights and measures, concerned about the keeping of disorderly public houses and brothels and gaming houses, concerned about illegal lotteries, and concerned about cruelty to animals. William got involved in the creation of the free colony of people in Sierra Leone, and he founded a church mission society, and he was one of the founders of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. But those were not the things that made him famous. William became involved, at the suggestion of others, in a campaign in Britain against the slave trade. And after 20 years, in 1807, the British Parliament passed the Slave Trade Act that made it illegal to trade slaves. Then in 1833, slavery itself was abolished largely throughout the United Kingdom in the Slavery Abolition Act. And three days after that act, William Wilberforce died. William Wilberforce did what Jesus would have done. He did what Jesus was doing. And so we must ask some questions of ourselves. Number one, are we Christians? People who have Jesus living in us? Does Christ dwell in our hearts? Are we rooted and grounded in love? Do we comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love for us? Are we ready to have the fullness of God in our lives? Are we going to ask and imagine that God will abundantly bless the world through us? We may not have the impact of a Wilberforce but that does not mean that we should have no impact at all. As we read this old letter, let's also do what the spiritual author of this letter told us to do, to do his work in the world, because the world still needs him. We need him so much that you and I come to worship together, to study together, to pray together, to think together about what we need to be doing that Jesus is doing. We come as well to a table where Jesus meets with us again and invites us to meet with each other, and together we can be filled again with the knowledge of his forgiveness and his love and his call to a new life. And so because Jesus said to do it this way, this is the way we do it. Ministering in his name, I invite all to come to the table. All who would come from 
north and south, from east and west, to sit at table here as a sign of the table that one day we will surround in the kingdom of God. Come to the table. We remember that on the night of his arrest, as Jesus was gathered with his disciples around the table, that he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. I invite you now to take the communion cup that you received at the beginning of this service and let us partake of the bread together. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the sign of the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. Let us drink together. Pray with me. O Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, creator of all things seen and unseen, redeemer of that which we deem irredeemable, savior of that which we have thrown away, lover of that which we refuse to love, we thank you for this meal by which we have proclaimed again the unity of your church and our hope for the community of the whole human family, by which we have been nourished with the knowledge of your love, with the strength of your spirit, and through which we have been challenged then, challenged to answer your call that is a command for us to be about your business in the world. Thank you for this spirit, for this supper, for this time, in Jesus. Amen.
Not long ago, I saw this statement, a prayer. Let it be our prayer. God, grant that the heat in my heart will melt the lead in my feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today and forever. Amen. Thank you.